Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this day you have given to us, for this opportunity you've put before us. And Father, as we consider the topic of the high road to reading, we ask for your guidance, your direction. We thank you so much, Lord, that you gave us your truth in words and gave us a mind designed to read that truth. And I pray that in this time we'd learn how to better teach our children to learn to read and to write to your glory and then grow up and be able to teach others to read and to write to your glory. We commit ourselves to you now, Father, for this work. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, I think most of you know my name is Jean Evans. And I've had the privilege to teach here at Crown College for nine years now. It's hard to believe the time's gone so very quickly. I work in the area of Christian education and elementary education. And another area I've been able to develop is a program for training and certifying reading specialists under the ILN, the International Language Navigators. And so we want to today, we're going to be giving you a little demonstration of what this looks like when we work with students. But let me introduce a few things first. We do face many challenges today. In the area of literacy, we find that we're losing the people who are able to read and write in our, in our country, and I think even around the world. We have, um, even here in this county, in Knox County, 40% of children in kindergarten are already below expectations. And of course, that has to do with the foundation even before they come to kindergarten. A print environment is being supplanted by the image environment. Everywhere we go, we're saturated with images. And so we have enough entertainment so that reading is crowded out. Students think it's boring today. It's not fast enough, not active enough, not easy and passive enough. Uh, in a sense, passive, because the person doing it is sitting back. Active is the entertainment coming at them. And today, we're just, people don't know what it is to get curled up with a good book and love reading. It's, we're losing it. So we have a twin problem. We have what is widely propagated here as a statistic is that 20% of our children aren't reading. They're dyslexic, according to the International Dyslexia Association. There's a bill in Congress right now to make this a national recognition and diagnosis of dyslexia. And so that's one out of five. That's a problem, the ones that can't read. Another problem, though, is the ones that won't read because they find it boring. Well, as we look at the high road to reading, I want to focus on three main areas. The first one, that's your blue handout, is we want to look at the high road as one that is scriptural. It is based on truth. I love this verse in Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. Through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So we see that it starts with wisdom. We have to have the mind of Christ. We have to have God's wisdom to even know how to lay a foundation. And for reading, we need to have the right foundation. We find that in the English language, the foundation is knowing the 70 common ways that we spell our 40 sounds. And so we call those phonograms. And we don't need to multiply and make it complex, the combinations for our children to learn. We don't need to put in blends, like the b and the ol, or the t and the r together, because if they learn the b and they learn the ol, or they, they learn the t and they learn the r, they can use that knowledge to decode words that have those phonograms in them. We don't need to multiply or double the combinations. We can keep it simple. But we do need to have the 70 common ways to spell our 40 sounds. We also need the 28 rules that work for how to combine those sounds into words, 98 keys. 98 keys that work no matter who you teach from preschool through adult. Dyslexia or adult illiterate. English is a second language. Those simple tools will work with any venue that you choose. And we need to start with that wisdom. And on wisdom, we build on that according to this verse, understanding. My understanding is established, and the picture God uses is a house. You lay the foundation, and you build a house, and what do you have in the house? You have rooms, and rooms that are built to function in a certain way. The kitchen, the bedroom, 
a bathroom, the family room. They all have a place and a function. And when it comes to um, building this house as it relates to learning to read, in every area we need to understand this, this picture. But in reading, we need to start with the foundation, but then build and have a way to organize what we want to next, which is the knowledge. English has a million words, they say, plus. Uh, so if we're going to deal with this huge, bulky language, wonderful language of ours, we need to have an organization, a way to work with this language. And so when we have this house that's built, then we get the knowledge. And we have lots of knowledge out there today, just like we have lots of words in English. In Daniel, it says that at the end of times, men will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. And we're inundated with it, but a knowledge in a pile somewhere isn't useful to us at all. And nobody can process all the knowledge. It's too much. Computers can't process all the knowledge today. So we need to start with wisdom. Therefore, we know what knowledge is important. And we need the understanding that once we have it, we don't have it in a pile somewhere, but we organize it in a structure for use. And that's what this picture of the house is telling us. And so what I'm, the, the statement I make here under scriptural based on truth is that the truth of God's design and language should be revealed by our instructional methods. And too often, we grow up thinking English is illogical. How many have thought that? Any of you? It doesn't make sense. It's full of exceptions, right? Is that what people think? If they've been taught so that they think that way, they haven't been taught using a method that's based on God's design and language. And so, so I, what I have here is after the first principle and then after the second and third, I'll give you some quotations that help to illustrate what I'm trying to say. And in this first quotation, Louisa Cook Motes says that research today in reading supports the necessity for directly teaching concepts about linguistic structure to beginning readers and to students with reading and spelling difficulties. The same structure helps in both situations. And with that in mind, they, in fact, with Lisa Cook Motes did studies, and what she did was they went to experienced teachers and they tested them to see if they had that knowledge of the structure of language. And if you move down the quote, it says the results of that study, they were surprisingly poor. Even motivated and experienced teachers typically understand too little. And they can't supply the sufficient instruction so their children can understand that design. That's the problem out there, widespread. And that problem is even amongst our circles. There's a lack of understanding of the real structure and design of our language. Now, the paradox in the next quotation from another book, Straight Talk About Reading, is that when a student understands the process of breaking a word apart letter by letter, or even more importantly, sound by sound, because the letters represent sounds, then they become automatic in decoding and don't have to struggle later with the letter by letter. We start with that. And in conjunction with that, Diane McGinnis wrote this quote in her book, Why Our Children Can't Read and What We Can Do About It. She said, children with reading problems, regardless of IQ, all scored badly on one particular test. Wouldn't you like to know what the one common problem is among students that struggle with reading? They may have other issues that vary amongst them, but they all have one common problem. The ability to hear individual phonemes in words. Their mind does not process words as the sound by sound construction that they are. And that is absolutely crucial for a good reader. And so that is a skill that we particularly focus on in a specialized way, and you'll see that in just a moment. Let me also mention what Noah Webster said about this. Did he understand that principle? Let's hear what he said. Spelling is the foundation of reading and the greatest ornament of writing. Spelling is the art of dividing words into their proper syllables in order to find their new true pronunciation. Children learn to read by first spelling the word. Now, when we think of spelling, we don't think of it the way Noah Webster did it. We think of spelling 
as C-A-T cat, right? C-H-A-I-R chair. And we are not integrating this spelling in the reading. And we don't understand, which Noah Webster did, that spelling is the art of dividing words into their proper syllables in order to find their true pronunciation. He knew that the connection with sound was the key connection, that you learn to read by spelling, but it's not spelling by letter names, it's spelling by sounds that connects with reading. Letter names are uh, helpful to use when you're alphabetizing, helpful in talking about rules about spelling rules, but they need to be put in the back burner when you're teaching reading. Teach letter names apart from your reading class. In reading class, you've got to hear and process sounds. Students that are weak in that area, they run into reading problems if you don't help them from the beginning to hear those sounds. And so, I'm going to spend a little time here with Shelby Huxley. She's been my assistant it was yesterday and today. Um, Shelby is in second grade. Her mom works with her at home. Her older brothers and sisters started off in a school in a traditional program with reading, but Shelby started in kindergarten with Spell to Write and Read. Her mom trained here at the college and took our Monday evening class. We call it Applied English Linguistics because we are learning the structure of the language and then applying that to teaching our children. And, and as a second grader, coming to the end of second grade, Shelby tested at the beginning of second grade at a 3.9, if I remember correctly. And so she started off in advance, a very well advanced for a second grader. And that was on a diagnostic spelling test. And so, uh, and that's done by dictation, which is the best way to test somebody's spelling. Then in the middle of this year, we re in fact, just after Christmas, her mom retested her and we were delighted, all of us, to find out that she was testing at a 7.0. Then just a few short months, the three short months from September through December and January, she had gained, what is that, another three grade levels. And so it's delightful what can happen when you lay this kind of foundation. Um, she also, not just with spelling, but in reading fluency, oral reading fluency, she had her first oral reading fluency test ever um, around, I think it was February by the time we did that. And I had her do that because I was using her in a class to demonstrate to my class how all this works. And she tested as high as you can test for third grade. It was like between the 90th and the 100th percentile and then beyond, and we couldn't even test how fast she was with her oral reading fluency. And so it's just wonderful to see the kind of tools we can equip our students with. Now, you have a second hand out there with an overview of spell to write and read. And we've named it that way as you may connect with the Noah Webster quote. We start with phonograms. Uh, phonograms, again, we have 70 common ways to spell our 40 sounds. And we're going to take these cards to do a few of these ways. And I actually, Rachel, would you come and help? Yesterday I had Rebecca Alexander here. But I'm going to have you stand right here, if you don't mind, and hold the microphone so that, just come right around here so that I can work with Shelby, because I can't, I don't have enough hands. <laughs> and you can even kind of close to me and then close to her when she talks. Do you mind doing that? Thank you so much. All right, Shelby's going to show you some of these phonograms that she's learned, all right? Notice that we're learning sounds, but then I'll ask her questions about some of them, about how to use them in words. Go ahead, Shelby. Tall sh that we may use at the beginning of any syllable after the first one. Any syllable after the first one, very good. And this is one of the Latin spellings of sh that we can use in that position in a word. Sh short sh used at the beginning of any syllable after the first one. Thank you, Shelby. And I think they're all together this time because yesterday I grouped them to talk about these Latin spellings of sh. sh. Used at the beginning of a word, at the end of a syllable, but not at the beginning of any syllable after the first one, except for the ending chip. Exactly right. This can be at the beginning of a word and at the end of a syllable. The Latin spellings are only at the beginning of any syllable after the first one. And this one, by the way, is 90%. And our students will learn those strategies. And there's one more spelling of sh in our words. What is it? Sh. Sh. E. That we may use at the beginning of any syllable after the first one. Okay, so 
So she's repeating the rule as we learn the phonogram. She knows how to use this phonogram in a word. This one has two different sounds, the sh and the zh. And we teach our students how that happens in the throat with the um, voiced and the unvoiced sounds. Oi, that we may not use at the end of English words. Why? Because English words do not end with I, U, V, O, J. Exactly. And what do we have here in oi? An I. An I. So we can't put it at the end. We may use at the end of English words. Exactly, because Y likes to stand in for the I when we want to put that at the end of a word. Mm. Two letter N mm, used only at the beginning of a base word. Perfect. She knows what it is and where to use it. And because of the phonograms, we're eliminating most silent letters in the language. Ow, O. Oh. Exactly. Ow, O. Oh. I. Three letter I. E, A, A. A, 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 U, A. Let me say a word about the order. She is learning these sounds of the phonograms. Each sound this phonogram can make, but in the order of frequency of use in English. And so she just did A, A, A. The most frequent sound is A. Ah. And the second most frequent sound? Uh. Hold on. A. 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 Very good. And the third most frequent sound? A. Ah. Very, very good. And then this one? Uh, you, uh. Thank you. <laughs> Oi, that we may use at the end of English words. Mm, to and mm, use both at the beginning and the end at the base word. That's right, both beginning and end. I. They can say I. What's the most common sound? A, E, E. <gasps> it's almost like our A, E, E. And this is a hard one. I stuck it in today. It's almost like A, E, E, but this one starts with E. And then? I. A. E. I. A. E. I. E. Good. So we're all still growing, right? What's this one? E. I. E. And it is our hardest one because it's the only one where the most common sound is the second letter, right? It says E most common, then I, and then I. Okie doke. K. T letter K. At the beginning. After a. Single vowel that says a, 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 a. Single vowel that says a, 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 a. Has to be a first vowel sound. We call them short sounds. A, E, E. That's correct. This is the a, E, E. Can I use it at the end of an English word? No. Because it ends in what? I. I. Mm -hmm. A, O, U. K, S. Uh, that we may not use at the end of English words. You. That's right. Ch, k, sh. Very, very good. The ch words from Anglo-Saxon, the k words from Greek, and the sh from French. We learned some origins, too, along with this. Two letters. Do you know what language that comes from? It comes from Greek. These words with this phonogram come from Greek. Okay, let's get this next one. A, four letter A. Okay, so we can have up to four letters for a phonogram. And this has one sound in A. A. Two letter A that we may not use at the end of English words. Ooh, that we may use at the end of English words. Ooh, uh, oh. <laughs> Ow. Oh, ooh, ah. Ow. Oh, ooh, ah. Uh. Let's say it, uh, one more time. Ow, oh, ooh, ah. Uh. Perfect. I have to work in that fourth sound. It's usually one of the last ones we really nail. Oh, ooh, of, off, ah, ow. All six perfect. All six perfect. And yesterday I told them about one of my former students. is a mom who's an engineer from Atlanta. And she had no plans, really, to do any homeschooling. But her oldest, as it turned out, had some severe reading issues and was severely dyslexic. They sent him to a specialized school in that area and they were paying over sixteen thousand dollars a year for school plus extra tutoring and he but it wasn't giving him what he needed it wasn't taking care of his problem with reading and dyslexia it was more compensating for it so she went ahead and did lots of homework found us in 2007 it was the first seminar training i ever gave here at crown college and she traveled up from atlanta for that training 
she's been using this program with her, her son and then her second son ever since. And, and he has learned to read. He's doing amazingly well. Her, her oldest is like 15 now. Her youngest, when he was in, I think it was just first grade, they were at a playground with another um, homeschooling mom in that kid situation. And the mother was just tall. Oh, the English is so complicated. How do you explain? I don't remember what the word was now, but it was something with a sound like uff, as in rough. How do you explain that sound? And this, this combination makes so many sounds. Well, this woman's son, her one-year-old, the one who, uh, not the one-year-old, I'm sorry, the first grader, <laughs> the one who didn't have any specialized reading problems. He just learned this from the beginning. He came walking by and heard that other mother's statement, and he said, that's easy. That's the third sound of oh, ooh, ah, fa, fa, ow. And when that other mother heard the six-year-old saying, why is that hard, and giving her the answer, she was just flabbergasted. But this knowledge that our kindergartners can pick up so easily, is, it's just not commonly out there. We've lost a lot of this knowledge. Perfect. Er, the er of church. Good. Let's see if we remember this one. E I E. Good work. Good work. Okay, so we that's just some of our 70. All right. We start with phonograms. And then we build on that knowledge by teaching spelling words. The how we teach these words is very important. As you know, we're not going to do it by letter names. We're going to do it with sounds. But secondly, we're going to have a marking system. We're also going to um, watch how the student hears the word first before seeing it and has to count syllables and break apart sounds first. And then I'm going to make sure that Shelby understands how to write um, those sounds if there's a question of different ways to spell them. Then she's going to say and write them. And if she does that, it's all simultaneous. She's saying with the writing, her handwriting and handwriting and hand are working together with in her brain together. The handwriting brain connection is a very important connection. A new research is showing how important it is. Um, yet people have used these techniques for years and years, decades and decades actually. And then notice how her eyes and her mouth and her ears are all working together with her hand. Did you watch that? Okay, she is in section 06. This, these two books, by the way, these two books, The Spell to Write and Read and The Wise Guide, along with these flashcards that I've shown you, the phonograms, and then we'll have rules to apply as needed, give you everything you need to teach this program, preschool through adult, or in any situation that I mentioned earlier, all right? One set of materials. Now, it takes somebody very diligent to read, break apart, and practice, or take a class or a seminar. We offer both of those here to understand how to do that. But once you get, take, it's like a plane taking off. Once you take off and get that initial understanding of how it works, for the rest of your life, you're be, I can't believe it's so easy. I can't believe I have a tool that will teach anybody with so few materials. <laughs> and so watch how we're going to do this. Watch how the student, after the teacher has these couple of books, the student needs only a pencil and paper. Or as a colleague that I've run into um, from a situation at a university I went to, I ran into a colleague who's been in Africa for several decades, and she's done it with a stick in dirt, applying these principles to a, a language that was just written down in Africa, and she was doing the first literacy in that language. And she said it, it worked twice as fast as any other method she'd ever learned for the most popular organizations to teach literacy out there. And so these principles go beyond our language, but we're going to show you how they apply with our language. Okay, I need to find my page. This is absolutely unrehearsed, all of it. And I haven't even double-checked here to make sure. You didn't put any more words in yesterday, right? So I get to do a couple more words after yesterday's words. Okay, I'm going to start with the word... Okay, let's do the word curtain. All right. Um, she hung a curtain in her kitchen. Curtain. How many syllables? Two. Two syllables. Now, as Shelby knows, when we think to spell, we have to exaggerate our vowels so she can hear what she's supposed to write. So we think to spell curtain. Curtain. She's very 
very smart. Sometimes she wants to help me right in the beginning. <laughs> okay. Now, Shelby's going to help me sound it out. K. Er. Er, the er of church. T. T. A. N. And this is the A. Two letter A that we may not use at the end of English words. Curtain. Curtain. Okay, say it real loud. And she's going to write those letters while she says them. We watch her sit. She's going to listen to you say them. Curtain. A. N. Read it. Curtain. That's spelling, and it's real good. But now read it the way we'd read it in a book. Curtain. Perfect. Curtain. Okay, now teach it back to me. I'm untangled. There we go. Curtain. A. N. Thank you. We mark the er of church. And what do we do? We. What did we just do? Underline it. Perfect. Do you know why we underline it? Yes, we do. Why? How many letters are in this phonogram? Two. two. How many sounds is it making? One. So we have two letters, one sound, right? So we underline it so we recognize that as a sound unit anytime we see those together. Okay? This syllable. A. We underline the A. Perfect. And we're underlining, we're doing this by sound. We're underlining the A sound. How many letters does it take to make this A sound? Two. Two letters. And so we underline it because it's a two-letter phonogram. Let's review our word. We think to spell. Curtain. Read. Oh, let's think to spell. Curtain. Curtain. Perfect. Let's do another word. Let's do the word. I'm looking for a good one syllable word. Let me go ahead here to the next section and let's do. That's hard to find one syllable words here. Let's do the word trace. We want to trace this picture. Trace. Syllables. One. Okay. And we think trace. Let's sound it out. T or A. And this is the k s. And you already figured that out. And then what do we need? The sound final e. Perfect. So think trace. Trace. Sound and write. Sound real loud so they hear what you're saying in writing. T r a s. Sound final e. Good. Okay. Read it. Oh, read oh, it first. Trace. Good. Now let's spell it. T er a s sound final e. Perfect. Now we want to analyze this and mark it. What will we have to mark here? Double underline the e. Why? Because the a is saying a. Well, the a is saying a. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Why do we underline the e twice? Because the e is the e saying anything? What is the e? The e is. Silent. Exactly. The E is silent. So two lines means it's silent. And you just told me that the E is there to make the A. Say. A. Perfect. So how will I mark that? You draw a bridge. From what? The A to the E. The A over the consonant to the E. And we have the E twice. Now I have a question. That's pretty hard work in E. Is it doing anything else besides making the A say A? The C? <gasps> yes. What is the k s saying here? What sound is it making? The s sound. Exactly. What can make the k say s? What is making the letter say s? The E. The E is exactly right. The k says s before an E. I or Y. Perfect. Very good, girl. So this E is doing two jobs. It's a two job E, isn't it? Good job. Okay, let's do one more word. Let's do the word. I didn't plan this ahead. <laughs> okay, let's do the word shadow. 
I went ahead sections, Noel. You're going to have to figure that out later. <laughs> Let's do the word shadow. Um, the sunlight at noon cast a big shadow. Okay, how many syllables in shadow? Two. Think to spell shad o. Shad o. Shad sh a d. Second syllable o. O. And this is the ow o. <laughs> we think to spell shad o. Okay, nice and loud. A D O O And all she's doing is writing these in syllables in her book and the syllables are separated with the space between them. This book is used for analysis of spelling words. It's the only place we write the words this way with analysis and markings and spelling. Outside this book, we test with writing them normally, we write them in sentences normally, but this is where we learn the words in such a way that the student owns them because they reinforce them so much through, as you see, this whole process where she sees, she hears, she says, she writes, she teaches them back to me. Okay, so teach that word back to me. Shad. Shad. Say the sounds. Shad. Uh huh. Oh. Oh. Uh huh. And let's mark it. We mark the sh. Why do we mark it? It's a two letter phonogram. Two, phone two letter phonogram. Two letter phonogram. Right, and it's only making one. one. Perfect. And what do we do here? Underline the owl. And what sound is it making in this word? What is this? Are we underlining owl here? What are we actually underlining? O. Oh. oh, very good. Let's underline the O and. What sound? Is that first or second? Second. Perfect. Let's put a two over the O. All right. So when we spell, we think. We spell. Shadow. And O. Oh, shadow. And we read shadow. Okay. Thank you, sweetie. So I can't, of course, th the lesson goes beyond this. The next step would be to review these words. I'd give them all to her in a sentence that she would write on the board to test on these words immediately. She does well with that, but we don't have time to do it. And what you see is that there's a very practical integration of these skills. Reading with writing, thinking skills and analysis. Our, our students, I've had, I can't tell you how many mothers come and tell me, um, and school teachers. I've trained both schools and, and mothers. I've done seminars for years. But how have they come to tell me, you know what? My student or my child's math skills have increased a lot. And it's just so interesting. I said, why do you think that is? And they said, well, the attention to detail and the logical thinking. And then I've had others that I've trained. Um, I remember a student at college, and she and her husband are, I don't think they're in Italy yet, but they're on their way, deputation for Italy. And she had a visitor, an Italian visitor, while she was taking my class. And she was so excited one day. She came into the class, and she said, I learned so much about Italian last night with this visitor from Italy. And the reason I learned is because I was able to compare it with the design of English and the rules I learned for English. And I knew what to ask. And so she was already a higher level with learning a new language because of her knowledge of the structure and how English worked. And I love how it just grows. I didn't understand that. Years ago, when I received my training, I was looking for the high road to reading, the best method for reading. And the Lord took me to a 16-hour training that revolutionized my understanding of the language. But I didn't realize how many areas it would actually affect and influence. What seemingly tiny little area has had a, a tremendous amount of influence. Um, Shelby, actually, what time is our session over? I don't remember. Anybody have it? 15? Okay. We're just going to let Shelby read a couple of sentences because we don't have a super amount of time. This is something she hasn't read before. It's a big book for a second grader. <laughs> they use it for up to sixth grade, and I think it's probably written on a more of a fifth or sixth grade level. But we're going to go down to where it talks about the, what's this title, Shelby? External Ear. Okay. She's going to just read a couple sentences for you. The Pinna, also called the oracle 
is the part of the ear you see from out the outside. It is like a funnel, guiding sound, external oh, hold it, guiding sounds into, into the, the external auditory canal. This okay, that's re you did sound that out really r well, honey, but it's the stress is different. It's canal. Canal. Do you ever hear of a canal? A canal can be a waterway that goes from one place to another that the man digs, that you can take maybe a boat along a canal. There's lots of those in England. You have this here. Um, and the ear has a little canal, and that's the opening that goes inside your ear. That's the ear canal. All right, that's all we have time for. But listen to her sound out words that she has never seen before. And that's really one of the joys of this. And I've had, again, a number of people who have worked with students, and in this case, it would be moms that would have come back to me because they had older children, some, a number of them, that started off in traditional curriculum, either at home or in a school. And then at home, they schooled their younger children with this from the beginning. And what it does is it structures the mind in a whole different way. And they've said to me, and as I've just watched with Shelby here, she can decode words far in advance of what she normally would have been able to, and much faster, and multi-syllable words. Um, it just becomes instinctive. All right, so the high road to reading. Let's make a few more observations on this. Not only do I believe what we have is scriptural and based on the truth, the truth of God's design and language, it reveals it, but I also believe it's simple. Many programs that throw in the blends with uh, the true phonograms, they cross the linguistic lines and it multiplies the combinations students have to learn. They have to learn over 150 of things instead of the 70. Now, anytime you just throw one or two extra steps in for me, and I'm frustrated because it takes longer and it's harder to do, right? What about if you more than double the steps? That's not efficient. And because it's not linguistically precise, you don't get the same linguistic foundation either. And so making things simple. Think of what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Not to be corrupted from the what that's in Christ, the simplicity that is in Christ. And so God has given us a method. Well, let's put it this way. God has given us a mind designed to read and decode. There's no way one out of five people should not be able to read. Christ said in the Gospels, have ye not read? Do you know every time he spoke the word read, it was with that question. Every time in the Gospels, have ye not read? It was expected. The ability to read is expected. And the word read is only used two other times in the Gospels. One is when Christ read in the synagogue, and the other one is when the people read the inscription on the cross. Every other time, Christ is asking the question, have ye not read? Recently, I read research by a man who says there's a specially designed place in the left side of your brain only, not in the right, that's like the letter box of the brain. And it processes these sounds and print symbols together. It's designed to do it. He's an evolutionist. He said, can't imagine how long it would have taken evolution to do that. <laughs> and I'm just laughing, but it's so interesting how he's pointed out this specially designed area in the brain just for the reading process. And so God has given us this, and he's given us the tools that we need to decode. So my statement there is a clutter-free, direct neurological pathway to reading will eliminate virtually all decoding difficulties. Even dyslexics, especially dys people with dyslexia, if they start out with this kind of method, they won't develop a severe reading problem. Many times they will remain slower because of the underlying issues in their brain, but they do not have to struggle without being able to read. And not only can everybody learn to read, they can re reproduce these skills in others. Um, Pastor said this morning, say something in order to be repeated. Well, we want to teach things, and he says this also to us, teach things in order for other people to teach them. The students that I worked with in our Christian school up north that grew up with this method, if somebody would be absent from a classroom to teach this particular subject of spelling reading, it was the students that filled in, because we didn't have enough other people in the area that could step in and teach this methodology. But my fifth and sixth graders, or my seventh to twelfth graders who had learned it in up to sixth grade, they could step in and teach it. And so it's so wonderful that we can train our students not just to learn it, but to teach it to others. 
the author's sons, they were tutoring at age 12 and then up through 20 and earning 10 to $20 an hour as tutoring because there's plenty of need out there where people cannot read and write. Okay, just a couple more comments. Um, a lot of good quotes here, things about letter names and blends from experts, but if you look on the back, I just want to point out one or two things for you. We also have too many pictures in beginning reading. Rudolf Flush has a great statement about students getting more from pictures than the text. So the eye movement of left to right is highly disrupted because the student looks up at a picture, down at the print, up at the picture, down at the print. And that left to right tracking is so important, which is why we don't recommend you learn this by word family methods. There's a number of curricula with good names, but they teach by like wall, fall, tall, call, a pattern of words with rhyming patterns. Not only does the language not truly function that way, but secondly, the eye tracking left to right is disrupted, and that is not helpful for our students. I want to mention our third principle, not just scriptural, not just simple, not just those two things, but sincere. The Bible needs to drive our world evangelism. And as we teach people the Bible, they need to know how to read this Bible. Um, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what I've said there is equipped with a Bible, a pencil, and paper. We can help evangelize people in English classrooms of all nations and enable them to read God's word for themselves. He that hath no money, come you by and eat. The technology hasn't added a single thing that makes reading easier to teach or a higher level of reading. The best equipment you can have is a child's hand, some kind of a pencil tool, and the brain, and a teacher that knows how to teach it. And once you know, once you know, I don't even need these books. I could go somewhere with any words and teach somebody how to read and write those words, because I know the tools. And then my students can learn with just their, their hand and a, and a writing instrument and paper. Okay, many uh, very good quotes here. Notice one last thing, the last quote under above where it says it works. The visual, auditory, kinesthetic, tactile pathways, use of them simultaneously is very important. Remember, it's not just the what of what you've seen here, not just the tools or the what, but the how we do it. How Shelby had to listen, break down, say and write. And it's not, people call things multisensory that don't really understand what kind of multisensory skills need to be implemented. They have to be simultaneously engaged with seeing, hearing, saying, and then writing is the kinesthetic. All right. Well, I think that our time is, is probably up here. And what I have is if you're interested in more information, they're going to be laid across the lot, but the chairs in the back. There's a Senate speech that describes these issues of phonics. It was given in Oregon. They were about to outlaw phonics in Oregon, and they did not. Secondly, there's um, a multisensory teaching description from the International Dyslexia Association that you could pick up if you want it. There's another one that has the myths of dyslexia. Dyslexia is not seeing words backwards or doing reversing letters. That's a common misunderstanding about dyslexia. And I think there's another one. Oh. Uh, a paper listing our classes coming up. We have a, some interims coming up this summer that make this training available to you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for what you've given to us. Thank you that this is your design. We just have the privilege of revealing it and teaching so others may understand it too. Father, I ask that you would equip us to go into your world with this global gospel initiative and that this would be a tool that would help many to be discipled in your word. I thank you for it, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. <laughs>